Hello folks. So this will be the last um, video before the Easter holidays and we are tackling neo-colonialism. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Just to remind you, as we always do, of where this fits into the framework. Page 12 of the module, we're in the political column. We've done the four physical factors, the four economic factors, and we, as of today, will be halfway through the political column. Um, and then it won't take us very long to finish the other ones once we uh, come back to it. Okay, neo-colonialism is on page 37 and 38 of your module booklet. So if you want to fast forward to those pages. Okay, neo means new. So neo-colonialism is new colonialism. And what you have to have in the back of your mind when we're talking about this topic and when you're doing any research and looking at case studies is do you think that what we talked about in the previous video, colonialism, the scramble for Africa, all of that stuff, do you think that essentially this is the same process repeating itself or do you think this is a slightly different process? Obviously by the end of this video you'll be a little bit better placed to be able to consider that and with further research you'll be even better placed again. So neo-colonialism is the idea um, that colonialism could be happening again. This time though it has nothing to do with Europe. This time it's largely linked with China. Okay, so here's a bit of proof. Now I don't expect you firstly to remember any of this and secondly uh, to be able to look at the detail. But what I want you to know is that anywhere that there is um, a little circle that is some investment by China and the colour coding system, so that the darker the shade of orange the more investment there is. Okay, so you can see that large swathes of sub-Saharan Africa are being invested in. This is ports. Now remember that 90, 90% of the world's trade is done by sea. Ports are clearly very important in a globalised world. They seem to be quite heavily involved in African ports. This is to do with um, infrastructure. Again, quite a lot of involvement. There's a graph. Oh, sorry, and that's the, the last bit. So you could spend hours and hours looking at evidence of this. I have given you a snapshot. There is quite a lot of proof that Chinese companies are investing massively in sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. All right, so this is neo-colonialism. Now, um, <laughs> if I teach you you'll be far too familiar with this graph. This is the Clark Fisher model and I go on about it all the time. Sorry folks. The Clark Fisher model shows you how um, the jobs that people do in a country change over time. And I just want to remind you that in the first round of colonialism, the scramble for Africa in the 1800s, what I was saying is the timing was not a coincidence the reason that colonialism began in Africa is because we were going through the Industrial Revolution in the UK, so we were in this phase. And the key thing that happens in this phase is that your secondary sector is dominant. In that phase, you need resources. And we were beginning to run out of resources in Europe, and we did a terrible thing, really, but we did uh, what we did, and we went to other places to get resources, and quite a lot of them came from Africa. So that was our colonial period. Well. China is in the industrial phase of the Clark Fisher model right now and hey presto they seem to, to be investing quite a lot in the continent of Africa. There seems to be an interesting parallel between the timing of this colonialism. Okay so just a reminder about that. But as much as that is a similarity um, there are some sort of key differences and uh, there's a diagram at the bottom of page 37 which is explained on page 38 that I want to talk you through. Frank's theory of dependency. Before we went into these rather strange times when we were still having face-to-face -face lessons I introduced you to something called the core periphery model. 
which is pretty much one of the simplest models ever. You've got the core in the centre, just like the core of an apple or the core of the earth. And then on the edges, you have the periphery. If you think of your peripheral vision, it's like the very edges of your vision. So the core is the centre, the periphery is the edges. So Frank takes the idea of the core periphery model and adds to it, as you can see. So what he's saying is that there are flows of goods and resources between the core and the periphery. But he sees that as um, evidence of dependency, which comes from colonialism. So page 38, I'm not going to read it to you, this is not Jack and Nori, but I'm going to just try and draw your attention to some quite important things that are said on page 38. And you might want to just highlight them, underline them or whatever. Okay, so paragraph number one talks about... Um, the fact that the periphery is kept in a state of dependency and underdevelopment because the developed world requires cheap raw materials and labour, i.e. for us to remain rich and powerful we have to have somebody to exploit and the countries that we tend to exploit are in the periphery, i.e. sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. And then he talks about the legacy of colonialism towards the end of the paragraph which draws on a previous video. One of the legacies of colonialism is massively unfair trading relationships that we talked about. We talked about tariffs and protectionism and trade blocks. And all of those things make it really hard to get a fair deal if you are currently a country in the periphery or if you're currently underdeveloped. And he very much argues that that's a legacy of colonialism, that if we had never been in charge of these countries, um, they wouldn't sort of stand for this. Uh, they'd protest more. We wouldn't have those kinds of relationships. Then uh, third paragraph kind of picks up. No, I'm lying. Fourth paragraph, sorry. The way world trade is organised today is a legacy of colonialism. So he very much picks back up on that idea. Um, Western nations, I'm right at the end of the paragraph now, Western nations further limit the export earnings of least developed countries by setting the prices for many products and setting tariffs and quotas which tax or limit least developed country products entering the first world. Um, we please do not talk about first, second and third world anymore, but you get the idea um, that there is a form of exploitation happening in trading relationships. Currently. And then it goes on to talk about neo-colonialism and one of the major differences is that this time it's not being done by governments, it's being done by multinational companies, MNCs, TNCs, whatever you want to call them. And that's a significant difference from the first time around. Um, so I'm just reading a little bit of this. Simpson and Sinclair point out that MNCs now dominate the capitalist world economy and many have greater economic and political power than least developed countries. Moreover, the MNCs are not accountable for their actions in law. And it goes on to talk about the, the problems of MNCs, which again we've mentioned in a previous video. So what neocolonialism does is it actually links together quite a few ideas together. All right. In summary, Frank's theory of dependency suggests that least developed countries can never develop so long as they remain part of the world capitalist system. Now, you could take that approach or you could try to think about China might be doing some nice things. OK, now there's an article which in an ideal world you've already read, but um, in case you haven't, there's a fantastic article that starts on page 13. And the section I'm going to ask you to look at today is on page 16. It's in the middle column. And it's the section that says, as with Zimbabwe, in the last few years, it is China which has come to the rescue. Now, this is part of a bigger case study on the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And it's talking about some possibly quite good things that China is doing. They're investing £5.6 billion in infrastructure, including 32 hospitals, two universities. Now, that's good, isn't it? 
Well, we, there was some of that that happened in the scramble for Africa. Um, Britain did build railways and things like that, so you could look at some good things. What do they get in return? Hmm. In return, China gets, among other concessions, 10 million tonnes of copper, 400,000 tonnes of cobalt. And it goes on to say that they're probably not getting a very good price. You could argue that this is exactly the same, again, happening. You could argue that maybe China are being slightly kinder and less destructive than we were. Um, there, on the slide in front of you at the moment, are some hyperlinks which you could check out and you could also do maybe a slightly wider Google search just to get your head around um, whether you think China are trying to be kind, they're helping another country to develop, or sorry, another continent to develop. Are they more interested in the resources like we were first time around? Just try to kind of get your head around that a little bit. Now, in terms of um, work, we're going to pick up on that in a minute. Um, so, there is a hyperlink at the bottom of this slide that is quite important, um, not just for geography, actually just for your kind of wider life understanding the planet. It, it, it's brilliant. Um, but just before we talk about Easter holiday work, case studies. Now you'll find with these hyperlinks, I have tended to focus mostly on Kenya and the Democratic Republic of the Congo for neo-colonialism and this Google search is all about a railway that's just been built uh, with Chinese money in Kenya. This one is all about Chinese companies getting their hands on resources in DRC. So I would have a little search about the um, actions of Chinese companies in Kenya and DRC. Right, without further ado. What I would suggest that you do over Easter are those three things on the screen some revision, get your case studies up to scratch uh, for where we've got to so far, and check out the story of stuff. Now, the story of stuff is that hyperlink right at the bottom of the page. Um, I'm going to actually open it because I want to show this to you. Okay, so they have a whole project, but the one video that I would like you to watch is their kind of original video. It's quite old now. Um, the story of stuff, 10 years old, yes, but it is brilliant. And if you get into this, if you really like it, as you can see, you could spend your pretty much entire lockdown probably uh, watching all of their videos and, and really getting into it. So the story of stuff project, definitely the 21 minute video if not more, that would be really, really good. It helps you understand this module, it helps you understand the world we live in, it helps you understand, oh, just just loads and loads of stuff, okay? Um, if you are feeling a little bit lost and at sea by the Africa module, can I just uh, remind you that that's probably quite likely. Once we get to the end of the 17 factors, we are nearly there. I reckon we can probably get there in about another four-ish videos. We will then revisit our five countries and talk about what we know about them. Um, what this has been is like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and I wouldn't be expecting you to make out the picture as yet. It, it is a bit confusing. But um, even though I'm not going to do any videos uh, for a couple of weeks, I will be checking email if you want me to look something over for you or I've confused you completely with something that I've told you, um, please just give me a shout. Okay, um, good luck with it all folks, stay safe, get in touch if you need to.